Okay, good. So, footing with almond. That's good. But anyway, there's a favorite or meaningful Thanksgiving tradition that you or your family have. That's the question. So, and uh, and and you can just make things up if you don't. That's okay. <laughs> Right. Ruth, do you have anything? Uh, just getting everyone together. I mean, not always now, but in the past, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All being around the table. That's nice. Except for the children. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough room. So they, <laughs> There's <laughs> they the kids' table. They got squished around there. Mm -hmm. you know, so. mm -hmm. Yeah, that was always so good. Good. Is it good? Yeah, I grew up, my dad owned a coast to coast hardware store. <clears throat> and we never put a thing out for Christmas until Friday after. Okay. Because he said you have to have Thanksgiving before you get to Christmas. Right, right. And mm -hmm. nowadays you never survive. But I, so we don't put a thing out until after Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, or Lowe's where it was out right after Labor Day, I think. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, if we're lucky enough to have the kids all home, uh, or at least one of them, after dinner, they cannot leave until they bring the tree up from the downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes they need to help their dad put in up outside decorations. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Good. Just family getting together. Um, turkey. And yeah, yeah. All the things, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. lots great. of food. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, as a kid, my uh, aunt and uncle, they used to raise turkeys. I mean, we're talking 60s when they used to be black, when they looked like turkeys yeah. instead of mm -hmm. white things. <laughs> and then it seemed like the turkey was always like a giant thing. But, you know, you were a kid then. Right, well, yeah. So yeah. it was always a family get together. That's fantastic. That's great. You guys, any Thanksgiving traditions, uh, rituals? Turkey. Just eating. <laughs> yeah. Turkey. I usually make green bean casserole and uh, yeah. pumpkin pie. Um, and then um, there's got to be football uh, oh, yeah. somewhere in there. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, this year the Vikings play Thanksgiving, or is it? Vikings play this year. On Thanksgiving? On Thanksgiving. They also yeah, they play the night. Night. Cowboys. I think they play the night game. Oh, okay. okay. They also play. They play the early game on Christmas Eve, I think, mm. this year. That makes pastors love it when they do that. <laughs> 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 kind of throws our counts off at the services just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, Have you right. got one hand? Which yeah, no, it's really, it's, yeah, it's really true. It's kind of funny, but it's true. The uh, five o'clock will be very large, and, and if they don't do well, then they're grumpy on Christmas, and that's not good. <laughs> you don't like it. I pray for the Vikings to win, because I don't want a grumpy Christmas Eve crowd. <laughs> That's never, ever, ever good. Good. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. It's fun to hear. Let's start with a word of prayer. <coughs> good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this evening and this gathering and this chance that we have to jump into your word and to understand a little bit about the things that you are trying to teach us and tell us, help us understand um, through, uh, through the scriptures. God, we ask that you um, bless our conversations tonight, bless our lives, bless our faith, and bless the lives and faith of those um, that we love as well. And as we step into this, uh, this Thanksgiving holiday, remind us always uh, to be grateful um, to you and to grateful to those around us for all the ways um, that, uh, that you bless us um, and that the relationships that we have bless us. Um, keep us safe uh, tonight and until we gather again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. I'm very excited. I can actually just jump right past that slide. Um, oh. The, um, but before we do that, just a couple of uh, uh, pieces, just some goals again for, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, um, I just want to ask if it was just going to be a slideshow or, or if, as Amanda said, you were going to do interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> did you ask her about the rap when I, uh, did, yeah. Uh, did, you know, okay. Um, yeah, I think we yeah. might have forgotten. But uh, yeah, yeah. She did ask about interpretive dance. Uh, yeah, yeah, she said that you love, like, really like interpretive dance. I really love doing that. Yeah. But you know what, we're recording. And anything I do that would go on the internet, that would be bad. So that would be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> proprietary. Proprietary, right. Yeah. 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 Interpretive dance. Thank you, Amanda. I'll remember that. Yeah. That's good. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we want to we more deeply understand how we read the scriptures, and we want to understand the life and ministry of Jesus, the way that God works in the world, how it connects to our life and ministry. We're looking at Ephesians, which is not the story of Jesus, but it's about Jesus. Um, it's about what Jesus does. Um, and really, about, we're going to get more into this in just a couple minutes, but 
really about how we connect um, with the teachings of Jesus, I think, is the, uh, um, what Paul is trying to, um, to get at. Um, we are going to spend a little time, oh, before we do that, I'm just kind of, I always do this thing. Um, you know, we, when we read the scriptures, we read them with an open mind, we read them in the biblical context. We try to figure out what's going on in the world around at the time, and then we apply them to our context. We say, what's going on in our world, and how do, um, I suppose I'm probably blocking your view of the screen, sorry. The, um, how do we uh, read them in that way as well? So that's uh, kind of our goals and our methods in terms of how we get at this stuff. So the book of Ephesians, I'm going to spend a little time, I'm just going to get some background, I think that might be helpful on, on what we know about the book of Ephesians um, and such. Um, it is, uh, I think it's a beautiful, beautifully written piece of work. Both, it's been considered both um, you know, word of God and scripture and wisdom and all that, but it's also just been considered great literature. Um, that's not uncommon. If you go to school, if you look at, like, for example, college course catalogs for schools that have religion departments, there will often be um, uh, a course offered called the Literature of Ephesians um, because it's considered such a well-written, beautiful document um, that people will just study and learn and try to understand that as a, uh, um, as a, uh, uh, as a piece of literature in addition to um, what we believe is, is Word of God. Um, and really, Paul summarizes the gospel and how it should reshape um, every part of our story. Um, so just to like, get some background. So this is a map of kind of that area where a lot of the biblical action was taking place. Down here is Jerusalem. You're familiar with those pieces from Caesarea. Um, so a lot of where Jesus' stuff was happening was all kind of right in this region here. That's where Jesus was spending his time and doing his ministry. Um, and then Paul, so we're familiar with Paul. Um, Paul actually started off as Saul uh, and uh, was um, someone whose job was to arrest Christians, um, to persecute. Then you had this experience, which is talked about in the book of, uh, book of Acts, where God said, not so much, <laughs> and, uh, um, and put scales in his eyes that he was blinded by, um, and then spoke to him. And when he came to understand God and God's love, the scales fell away and he could see. And he saw with a new sight, both physically, but also spiritually. And so he became then, um, really, probably the, um, um, the, uh, the greatest of all the apostles, the teachers of the church. Um, and this happened ag all after Jesus' resurrection. But he is the one, I mean, I think probably, you know, half of, half to three quarters, well, at least three quarters of everything after the Gospels in the New Testament were written by Paul. I mean, he wrote, did a ton of stuff. And he traveled lots of places. Um, and just so I can put it up, so I'll come back to it in a second. So this is where Ephesus is here. So it's kind of across the sea from Jerusalem. Um, but Paul, who, his, his eye-opening experience was down in this region, wound up doing a lot of traveling. He actually took three, what they call, missionary journeys. Um, and his three journeys, this is just the third one, um, looked like that. Um, this guy got around. Um, <laughs> You know, and a missionary journey would be years. Um, you know, so for example, you know, he went, um, he started off in Antioch, went to Tarsus, up here, um, Ephesus. He was two years in Ephesus on this third journey. He lived there for two years during the time. So he would go and he would settle in for a while. Um, and then he moved on, um, Troas, Philippi, Thessalonica, um, down to Corinth, and then kind of worked his way back. Um, eventually, he actually, I think the second journey, he wound up, he wound up actually over here for a while. I mean, he was kind of everywhere. He was, he was all over the place. And, uh, but that was what he believed that his call was, um, was to be the one who went and taught it. So what he would do is he'd travel to these towns, and like I said, he would settle in. He would settle in in Ephesus, spent two years there, um, and he, would, um, he was incredibly effective. Um, lots of people in Ephesus at the time came to faith in Christ through Paul and his teaching. Um, and he would start churches in these communities and train leaders up and be there for an extended period of time, and then he would leave and go do the same thing in the next city. And how churches in that time, not so much like churches we think of now, it was really house churches. Um, so it would be a group of people that would gather in someone's home. So it might be four, six, eight, ten, twelve people, right, as opposed to you know, a couple hundred or, or whatever it might be. But these little house churches would be scattered throughout the town. Um, and he would be the ones to meet with the leaders and train them. Now, this was risky business because he um, actually, uh, I mean, people were, the Romans were trying to, uh, uh, to arrest people that were Christian. And so um, 
it was all kind of done under the table. Um, you have these conversations that would be very, very quiet, low key. Um, they would use sig signals um, or signs to indicate that that's another person who believes, then they knew it was safe to talk, that kind of a thing. Um, but he actually knew all the tricks because he'd been one of the best at catching Christians <laughs> before. Um, Ephesus itself, <coughs> if you look at the size of the dots, yes, they indicate size. So Ephesus it was actually that and coming around to Corinth were the two largest cities that he spent time in. So he was there um, in this place for a long time. It was, again, very effective um, and, uh, and, and led a lot of people to faith. Um, after two years in Ephesus, um, he was arrested. He got caught. Um, obviously, not criminally, because the journey continued. So he was arrested. He was imprisoned. Um, we don't know exactly for sure how long he was imprisoned, um, but he was imprisoned. And uh, eventually was released and then continued. But I think it was released with the condition that he not come back. One of those kinds of, <laughs> kinds of things. Because that was the last time that he was in Ephesus. Um, the, um, uh, it was in prison that Paul wrote the letter. I mean, there's some references throughout the book that he refers to things about being, being a prisoner for the Lord, that's a phrase, or being in captivity, that's a phrase he uses. So he's talking about that as when he was in. But, but what he would do, so he would start these churches, and then he would leave, and then because he wasn't there super long, he trained people up, but um, things kind of went out of whack after he would leave. Sometimes it was, it was relational fighting, infighting that, that had happened. Sometimes they would get um, in a little bit of a tizzy theologically, they kind of go off the deep end a little bit. That was what happened in Galatia. He's not on this trip, but when he went to Galatia, they actually did a, um, uh, um, went out, went out, took a little bit of a theological uh, right turn, and he had to kind of draw them back um, onto the path. He would do that by letter. Um, and so he would write these letters. So Paul's letter to, to the Ephesians was written to the people that lived in those, in that community that were at that house church those house churches scattered throughout the town to kind of either to kind of correct them or guide them or bring them back in line or sometimes simply to praise them. He also wrote notes and just said, you're doing great. Um, sometimes he wrote letters also to individuals. Paul's letter to Timothy, his second letter to Timothy, those kinds of things are letters that are written to individuals to give them encouragement or, or instruction. But he would leave, go to these next places, and then he would send letters back by a courier um, to them. And what they would do is they would take this letter would circulate among these little house churches, and they would just be read aloud. They were never copied, because again, they were trying to not get in trouble. They didn't want copies of things floating around, but they were just read aloud in the house church, um, and then someone would bring it to the next one. So sometimes actually getting a letter distributed, even once it got to back to the town, took weeks or months or whatever, because they had to get to every place. So um, that's kind of how Paul um, operated. I have a question. Yeah. How did he know what going on there. They were they sure. Or there would be, um, there was kind of a network of people that traveled around, and so he would get word. Someone would, you know, if, if he was then up in Philippi, someone that was traveling that direction who was a part of that community would stop, and they'd have, I'm sure they'd meet for coffee, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, or, uh, um, and, uh, and he'd say, you all, things are going, you know, he'd say, how are things in, in Ephesus? Well, it's great, except such and such and such and such, that kind of a thing. So when he's in prison, somebody would get word to him? No, no, the letter, um, the letter was written, actually in this particular case, it's a great question, thank you. Um, I believe um, the letter, uh, he was writing, Ephes the letter to the Ephesians is a little bit different because he hadn't been gone very long, he was just in prison. I think, so I think part of it was also encouragement. He also, I think, didn't know for certain if he was gonna survive. Mm -hmm. So it was also kind of a little bit of a last, you know, this might be my last thing I write or send, that kind of a thing. I think that was part of it as well. And we don't know for sure, but I'm guessing um, that he probably gave the letter to somebody at, on his way after he was released, um, would be my guess. So he didn't actually get it out of, um, hand out while he was in prison, but rather after the fact. That would be, we don't know that for sure, but that's what they speculate, because normally they didn't let prisoners just send mail. <laughs> um, uh, at that time. Great question, thank you. Any other <coughs> questions? That's just a little of the background, um, background piece of it. The, um, so the letter itself, oh yeah, here we go. So I, uh, I like to see that. Huge city, epicenter. Of, oh, that's the thing. Ep, um, Ephesus was the, uh, um, one of the centers for worship of the Greek and Roman gods. As a matter of fact, if you were to go to that region now, you find archaeologists have uncovered 
lots of statues of Greek and Roman gods that are in that area. So the Christianity was very much not the norm or not accepted uh, in that time. He said Paul for two years, arrested in prison, to kind of talk through that. Um, the letter itself is broken down into two sections. Um, the first half, the six chapters long, the first half, like chapters one to three, um, Paul is really exploring the story of the gospel, Jesus' story, um, and how the story of God and God's people really come to a, come to a, come to a climax, come to fruition um, in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the faith um, up until that point. So that's really kind of what he's, what he's getting at in there. The second half of the book um, is linked to the first, first half by the word therefore. We'll look at that in a second in chapter 425. Um, and here Paul ex expires. Wow, that was spell check that the wrong direction. Um, explains how the gospel story should affect and impact every part of our own life story. So basically what he's saying is the first half, um, you know, here's what Jesus did. Um, here's how Jesus loved. Here's, how, here's who Jesus is. Therefore, here's what you do. Okay, here's how you live. So there's, there's both um, um, you know, content and application, I think is the way we'd, we'd frame it, right? So there's, there's a definite um, uh, piece in here that gets into the idea of what's the, uh, what's the impact of the gospel. So it's, or you know, I had one seminary professor who would frame it as what and so what. Oh, that kind of a thing. And so, um, if you look, in, in actually it's uh, chapter 4, verse 25, um, the, the, that sentence begins with the word, therefore, and that's considered like, that's the tipping point, that's when the story switches. Um, it's the beginning of chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, here's what you do. Therefore, here's how you live. Therefore, here's how you love. Um, because of all the things that happen in the first, um, the first three chapters. So what I want to do is I just want to kind of talk through quick those six chapters and kind of give just a, a, a quick explanation of what each one is about. And then we're going to jump into um, chapter one and start looking at some of those, those pieces that are there. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, then, so chapter one, just as a just stylistically, um, and you can look and follow along as we go here, although we're not going to jump in and read right now as a group or anything. But chapter one um, begins with really this beautiful poem. It's a Jewish, it's called a Jewish style poem, a, a, a poem written in the Hebrew style, um, where um, it's, uh, Paul is talking about God the Father blessing, um, the phrase he uses, the covenant people, the people of the promise. Okay, that's kind of, sort of the language that Paul uses. Um, and that his point in the chap first chapter is that, that through Jesus, anyone can be adopted into that family. There are no limitations. This is important because at the time, the Jewish people believed even the Jewish people who were following Jesus believed that Jesus was there for them um, and not for the Gentiles or other folks as well. Um, but through grace, God's purpose was to unify all things. So there's this heavy unity theme that runs throughout the book of, book of Ephesians that's a part of that. Um, and that the Jews were a part of God's family because God had made that promise to Abraham, but that the Gentiles could be adopted into that family. And therefore, through that, they were, um, they were unity, unified, and God is a God of unity. Um, and then he closes that chapter with his prayer um, that all people experience the power um, that raised Jesus from the dead. They all experience that sense of love. That's what the first chapter is about. The second chapter, Paul digs into God's grace. Um, and starts talking about that as the why for why God sent Jesus. Okay, it's because of grace, because of love. Um, that's actually where my favorite. When, if you're ever here on a Sunday when I give the Bibles out, uh, to the kids, I'll always tell them highlight my favorite verse, then I find other favorite verses and highlight those. My favorite verse is Ephesians 2 8. It's right in that section. Um, For by grace you've been saved through faith, it's not your own doing, it's a work of God. Um, that's what grace is about. That's Paul's language from here where he's explaining that's why God sent Jesus to, to live those things out and make um, in human form um, and, uh, and to join. Uh, and to join people for people to join their lives um, to Christ's life in the resurrection. That's really that second chapter gets into the grace thing. The third chapter, um, Paul, it's kind of a funny one. Paul marvels kind of at his role and the gift that he's been given as being um, one of the one of the people who gets to spread God's word to the people who are not Jewish. Um, that he's really kind of going into foreign territory here. Again, Ephesus, not exactly friendly territory if you're Jewish or if you're Christian. <laughs> but he gets to walk, and he's both, 
and he gets to walk in the middle of that and uh, um, and take risks, but to do so is an honor. Um, and even though he's in prison, he's grateful to God that he's had this opportunity um, uh, to see this family of faith grow in this way. And then he closes that chapter with a prayer um, that God's Holy Spirit will take a hold of people's hearts. Um, chapters 4 and 5, okay, um, Jesus, or Paul begins challenging um, the people in Ephesians to live their lives, aligning their story to God's story. Um, he talks about the church as a big family, and he uses, that's the one, that's also one of my favorite chapters, where he's talking about there's one life, or one Lord, one faith, one life, one baptism, um, and, and the word one appears about 6,000 times in this little, little chapter. Um, and he's talking about that sense of unity. We'll look at that in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, but he talks about unity does not necessarily mean the same thing as uniformity, that we're not all the same. We all have these distinct gifts that we've been given. And because we have these distinct gifts, um, that's what makes the unity rich. Um, that we all, we all come, we bring something different to the table. Um, and then um, uh, he talks about, so he talks about the old and the new. Um, and he talks about the sense of new humanity. What Christ does to us is Christ clothes us in clothes that are new. Right? That's one of the phrases he used. We have this new life, this new humanity. And he contrasts the old and the new. And then in the sixth chapter, um, he reminds uh, the readers... Um, the people in Ephesus, about um, the danger of evil um, and about, um, about staying, staying true to the idea of grace and love. He talks about there's forces that will try to undermine our unity and destroy, their, destroy this new sense of humanity. Um, and Paul challenges to stand firm. And then he talks about this, this you've heard the scripture about the armor of God. Um, that's where this comes. Use the armor of God to remain firm and steadfast in your faith. And then um, he wants us to develop habits, faith practices that help us grow. Um, and so it, it goes followers of Jesus. So it's kind of an overview of how the book itself is broken down. Any questions about any of that? I just flew through a whole bunch of stuff really, really fast. But no, I was just wondering if you could repeat it. Absolutely. <laughs> but it is recorded. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we'll, uh, we're going to actually go back now over the next four weeks. We're going to kind of dig into one section at a time, at least for four of the, uh, um, the sections there, and which we're going to do right now. So what I want to do, actually, is look at Ephesians 1, 1 to 14. So starting off with chapter 1. I'm going to grab myself. I'm going to That's embarrassing. Um, Right. So, um, 1, 1 to 14 is the beginning of the book. And again, it's this, um, uh, this, it gets into this idea, just kind of jumping back. I was talking about, it starts off kind of the sense of poetry, um, and then the sense of being adopted into God's family and the unity of God's family. So, um, would there be somebody that would be willing to read out loud just verses 1, to seven, 1 through 7? Let's split it in half. Go for it, Bonnie. Thank you. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So we want to read the next seven chapter verses that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, um, who 
were the first uh, to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So now I'm gonna read it one more time, just but starting at verse three through 14. Um, and you heard it once, but this time we read it again and just kind of pay attention. Are there words or phrases that catch your attention? Things that you notice or things that speak to you? Are there feelings or emotions that come through this text, especially thinking about the context, where he is and, um, and, and the world that he's in? Um, and are there things that are phrases or words that are repeated, either literally or just in terms of the meaning, that might carry some significance? Okay, I'm curious to hear that. So I'm just going to start at verse 3 and <coughs> continue through. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we've also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who, him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who are the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance, to our redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. For me, the phrase that, that kind of stood out was at the end of, um, of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. I don't know, the word lavished is just kind of a fun word. It just implies this abundance or this overflow. Or this, uh, are there other words or phrases that stood out for you? Other two. Oh, go ahead. Thirteen makes me think of baptism. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 For the seal yeah. part. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Marked the cross of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. It's been a lot of phrases praising, <laughs> praising His glory. Mm -hmm. Not Christ. <laughs> yeah, we look back at that. You know, the first, the first half is about Jesus. The second half is about us. On the book, he really. Excuse me, sorry. Um, he really, um, yeah, he talks about Jesus a lot. Yeah. He really does. You can see that. Uh, other things stand out to you? Well, there's some familiar things that we say, or you say in church. You know, mm -hmm. the liturgy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of our liturgical elements come out of scriptures. People don't always realize that. Um, that's really true. Yeah. Grace is repeated a lot. Shows up a lot. Yeah. My grandmother used to say that Grace was her favorite, or Grace, or Ephesians was her favorite book because her name was Grace. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any else? Other things sort of stand out to you? What about, do you get a sense of emotion in the reading? Where his emotional state is at? He's definitely a believer. Yeah. <laughs> Very fervent. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a sense of excitement in the writing, I think. Mm -hmm. Like like he's really that's what I'm looking for. I don't know. He's very positive, and it does not sound like something that'd be written by a guy in jail. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, 
does not feel like a prisoner letter. Maybe because Apology became a Christian, mm -hmm. having that uh, moment on the road. <laughs> well, it's true. I hadn't, really, I hadn't made that connection, but you're right. Um, I mean, he has a different background, mm -hmm. being a Gentile, and no, he was a Jew. He was a Jew. He, he was a Jew, but mm -hmm. coming into Christianity. Yeah. Well, for him. Isn't, I mean, I would, I'm just trying to, you know, you try to put yourself in someone's position 2,000 years ago. It's a hard enough time putting someone's position when they're at the quick trip next to me. But um, the, uh, every day is a second chance. It feels like that's kind of how he's living. Every day is because he's done all this stuff that was terrible, and he suddenly was given this forgiveness and a new identity, literally a new name. And um, every, now everything he does is just bonus. It's great. So being in jail. You know, compared to what could be, it's not bad. Not bad. He talks about the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. as a deposit. A deposit. What, what verse are you looking at? Ruth? Um, near the end, at the bottom, fourteen. Right here. Right above it. After. Yeah. Let's see you. Can you, what, what, read, read the version you have. I'm curious how they phrase it. If you don't mind. Did you, um, just a little bit. Oh, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing, guaranteeing our inheritance. There's a little sidebar here that says the Holy Spirit is God's seal that we belong to Him and that His deposit guaranteeing that He will do what He has promised. The Holy Spirit is like a down payment, a deposit, and a validating signature on a contract. The presence of the Holy Spirit in this demonstrates the um, genuineness of our faith and proves that we are God's children. It's really interesting because in the version I'm reading out of the NRSV, what version do you have? Do you know? Yes. And I be. Because the version in the NRSV says, Mark with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, this is the pledge of the inheritance. Mm -hmm. So pledge implies promise. To me, a deposit just feels a lot more, I don't even know what. I mean, Banky. well, transactional, but also like I'm putting, so I'm paying into this. You know, there's almost a deeper level of commitment, maybe. So you give a deposit and don't follow through, you don't get the deposit back. Right? I mean, that's interesting. That's an interesting choice of words. Does anybody have anything different than either pledge or, pro or, uh, or deposit? I'm curious. Okay, are there themes or verses or words that are repeated through this that you think that oftentimes when things, and I will say in, in scriptures, if something says, said once it means something, twice it really means something, and three times you better pay attention. Because <laughs> that they repeat things, that's how they show emphasis. Anything that um, felt repetitive in that way? Certainly grace, we talked about that before. About the praise. I praise and glory, that yeah, pops up a lot. The other word, when I noticed it, I just noticed it because it's not a a usual word. This is where redemption shows up twice or three times. Twice for sure. In verse 7 and then again in verse 14. Yeah, there's stuff in there. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, The, um, a lot of this, I think, comes back to the idea of identity. Um, Jesus is tying, I'm sorry, Paul is tying this idea of who Jesus is to our lives and our faith and, and who we are in the midst of that. So this is the part where we're going to have you pair, okay? 
Um, all right, so um, what elements, when you think of identity, things that I, you know, if I think of my identity, I can say I'm if brown thinning hair, that's a characteristic. Uh, I, uh, um, I like music. Um, uh, you know, there's things that are about me, right? Are there things that talk about our identity as people who follow Jesus um, in these different sections? So there's for five, one, two, three, four. Um, uh, so I'll, we'll do it this way. Um, if you two would take the first one, so chapter one, verses three and four, take five and six, seven, eight, um, that's four verses, but you guys are like exceptional, so that's why I'm giving you the wrong. Nine to twelve. <laughs> Nine to 12. Um, and I'll take 13 to 14. Okay? Um, and just look through that piece of scripture, and like, are there words in there, or when he's talking about our identity, what do you think he's talking about for people that are, that are believers or followers? Discuss amongst yourselves. We'll take a couple minutes. <coughs> So I'll just give you mine, okay? Like for example, I'm looking at 1314. Um, 1314 says, um, uh, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and then believed him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption in God's own people. So I would say that in terms of our identity, I'd look at that and say, part of my identity is that the sense of being sealed um, by the Holy Spirit, sealed in God's love. Um, that describes kind of who I am as a follower of Jesus. Um, so is there another characteristic in the section that you're looking at that would describe us in our life and our faith? Does that kind of make help? Less, because it's true, it's male like three times. Mm-hmm. Well, there's not much word. Yeah. We have to in the form on yeah. Yeah, you should be able to look through whichever book you want. I mean, that's quite a bit. Yeah, right. Holy and without fault. But even before he made the world, he loved us. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Yeah, we're not sure. Yeah, well, that's all right. Talk, yeah. We'll talk about it because okay. it's not always completely clean and obvious, but yeah. and sometimes and there's more than one. So, what did what did you guys come up with for verses three and four? Any thoughts? Well, he's really blessed us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
and his blessing and that even before he made the world, mm -hmm. he loved us and chose us. Yeah. Yeah. Lust and chosen, I think, are yeah. words that you, you can pull out of it for sure. That's when I looked at it the first time without reading it. I just looked at it and you can just see those certain words within that small little passage mm -hmm. that blessed was popped up a couple of times. So right. Like automatically a dead giveaway. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. What do you guys think, Francis? Should we look at that together? Well, we're thinking like love and grace. Mm -hmm. Kind of picking that out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think that's um, full of grace, full of love for sure. Um, you could probably also pull, um, pull the word adopted. Um, what is it? In verse 5, mine says, um, He destined us for adoption as, sorry, He destined us for adoption as His children through Jesus Christ. Ours says, He destined us in love to be His sons through Jesus Christ. Interesting. According to the purpose of His will. Huh. That 1952 revision. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Took way back, yeah. Mine says he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Interesting. Predestined. Mm -hmm. So what they did in the NRSV, what they did in the NRSV is if the if the words um, were gender specific in the original language, they kept them, and if they weren't gender specific, what had happened in older versions is it was always translated as male, um, so sons would be used. But the reality is that word. Um, would be more likely a tra better translated now as children. Mm -hmm. um, but the, just the way the, the culture was when they did the translation, it all was geared towards the male, right? That was the, mm -hmm. the predominant. And so, um, so if it says if it says male, it was probably because that was in the original language. Or if it says children in the NRSV, if it says children, that meant it was more the generic, uh, the generic version. Um, and then a rabbit hole. The, the NIV is what I have. Yeah, yeah, but a lot, all the old versions also did male pronouns for every form of God. And the reality is the original language, the pronouns around for the Holy Spirit were feminine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so we talked about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was really, in biblical times, it was, it was, a, it was a feminine characteristics or feminine traits. And the Holy Spirit, that's what we talk about, the Holy Spirit is the part of God that nurtures and cares. Mm -hmm. Heals and restores because mm -hmm. those are considered feminine characteristics, that kind of a thing. But in the, when it got translated, it all went male because everything did. <laughs> That's how it, uh, how it worked at the time. So, sorry, rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's. So yours says so adopted, adopted is. Mine says, mine says adopted in, uh, in verse 5. So does the NIV. Yeah, switch back to that. I've sure. read all that. <laughs> so that's interesting. That's an interesting change. What about seven and eight? We came up with uh, redemption and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Which, which prayer is it that for, forgiveness uh, of our trespasses? Lord's prayer. It is, it is our Father. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Sorry, I was like, oh, I know this, and I can't right. remember. Well, that, it's interesting because Paul does it. There's different things that came out of Jesus' direct words that he'll echo. He doesn't always directly quote, but he echoes. So the fact that he says forgiveness of our trespasses, that's what the, my version says in verse 7. It was a direct echo back to the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness of sins, by yes. Okay. So what, if Paul didn't like Christians, where did he get all of his education from on like Christians? a great question. I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, I think um, everything in that era was all, especially because it was all kind of under the underground, right? It was all oral tradition. Um, you know, at this point, I have to go back and look. Um, like even the, like, you know, the Gospel of Luke, thinking back to two studies ago, wasn't written until 70 to 80 years after Jesus. Everything up to that point, all those stories were told verbally, and then it was finally written down 70 or 80 years later. Um, and so he would have, he would have just been a, he would have had to be with the disciples hearing the stories, and then I think he was a pretty smart dude. <laughs> he was educated. And so yeah, he was educated, and so he was able to put this stuff together. Um, 
uh, as Owen with the others. And then there's the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're for, for sure. All right, um, what about 9 through 12? The, uh, um, the long verse. Yeah, we bring us together. Uh, we are chosen, we are predestined. Mm. Um, and let's see our, our purpose is to do his will mm -hmm. praise him I guess that that too. Mm -hmm. it's interesting that it says predestined Yeah. in verse 11 in mine it says having been destined according to the purpose mine is, mine is predestined mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. predestined before. Yeah, that's an that's an interesting because how would you like um, how would you define those two words differently? Destined versus predestined. Like it's pre-planned. He sort of decided that. Yeah, planned versus pre-planned. Is there a difference? <laughs> But I would think pre predestined always makes me think that there's something way before you that was in the works. Mm -hmm. You're just mm -hmm. maybe even not you know, or it was decided already or mm -hmm. known already. Where destined is you're destined to do this, but you maybe don't actually succeed. Mm -hmm. But the predestined to me is like they know what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. There's a box that you're going to fit in. So what's the answer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Um, let's see here. You can see if there's a note on that. There's not. Hmm. It's interesting. All right. I think this is interesting because it, this idea, the sense of what what um, what Paul's getting at here, I think, in terms of identity, and I think it comes back to this idea of being marked with the seal, um, marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. That there's a mark, and we've been given something. We talk about it in the Lutheran tradition as being a part of our baptism. Again, that's why we say seal of the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ. But that we are, or sometimes we'll use the word claimed. God claims us as God's own. Right? That's what happens in baptism. God planting a flag, claiming you, saying, you belong to me. Um, and, uh, um, and I think what Paul's doing in this whole section is, to some extent, defining what that means. Blessed, chosen, redeemed, loved, grace-filled. I mean, all the things that you guys talked about on the list kind of defines what it means to be living in Christ's identity. Um, like kind of making sense there, but sort of. So he's really doing is he's kind of he's giving us a whole bunch of name tags <laughs> and recognizing that that's that's who we are. I just googled it quickly, and it's, it's indicating that destined means that it was going to happen. Predestination is a definite doctrine in religions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's <laughs> just a matter of semantics then, or right. Well, and the the, the doctrine piece that that part I know about the because uh, there's if, if there are some denominations that are um, that believe in predestination, um, and what that means is so there is a there and this actually gets into what we're going to talk about um, in the last five minutes, which could take two hours. So, <laughs> um, but um, the uh, so if if. If it's about predestination, it means that God has a plan. Okay, and you will follow, this is the plan, you follow it. Now, actually Lutherans are not predestination people um, because we believe that we have free will. And in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about in freedom Christ has set you free. I mean, you have the ability. So here's the deal, God has, so I always, when, when people say to me, well, God has a plan. Um, if I'm feeling snarky, <laughs> um, I'll say out loud. If I'm feeling less snarky, I'll just say it in my head. I'll think, I'll say, actually, I think God has a hope. I like that. Mm -hmm. because, because I think God has a hope for our lives. Um, but God also lets us choose something different. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we can go a different direction. Otherwise, we'd all be perfect. We would, there, there would be no sin if we were all just following God's plan. Um, so clearly, we have choice. Um, 
and uh, and and God holds. So the way I like when I'm talking with um, when I'm talking with kids about how God works with predestination and such, and this really doesn't work anymore. This image group, um, but I used to talk about um, a film editor. Okay, so a film editor is someone who sits and there's two <coughs> reels: the empty reel and the full reel. And the full reel of the film is playing feeding through to the empty reel, and the editor is watching it go by, and then is stopping it and making cuts and splicing film together or splicing new pieces in, right? That whole kind of a deal. And I, what I would talk about is that, in some sense, it might set, my, my sense of God in this, in this scenario is God is like an editor. God is sitting actually outside of time. God can see the beginning and God can see the end. He can see the whole film, right? Um, but God can, and God can reach in and can see what, uh, you know, and, and there's some editing that happens, there's things that God does. Um, but God can also look down and say, you know, okay, so if Todd makes this choice, um, then there's this, there's this outcome. Um, if Todd makes this choice, choice B, there's a different outcome, I hope he makes choice B. Um, but it's really up to me to determine, or if you ever look at another image I use sometimes is, like if you're in a helicopter flying over like a river delta, like the Mississippi River Delta where it all branches, God can see the canoe. <laughs> I hope he takes that path and not that one. If he goes on that one, he's going over a waterfall. Um, and occasionally God may, may mess with it a little bit, um, but, but it's really up to me to choose. And so when I think of predestination, it's people who believe that there's a path that's predetermined and I can't change it, versus um, if God has a hope instead of a plan, then it's where God is saying, I've given all these choices, I hope he picks the right, and I've given him everything he needs to make the right decision, I hope he follows through. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, but you would think that um, if you believed in predestination, that you're hoping that God picked a good plan for you. Yeah, yeah. You know, because <laughs> what if he picked the wrong plan? No. I think that the idea is, and that's where I think that's where I think I think the idea of choice and freedom wins. Is I think God does have a good plan. I think I think it's just not us. Um, and the problem is actually, it's not always us. So somebody else makes a decision that's bad, and it has an impact on me. You know, the person, the the, the family member of the person who's killed in a drunk driving accident is paying for the crime of the person who was driving drunk. That's two people removed, um, which doesn't seem fair. But it's also about choice and, uh, and having the ability to make decisions. Like kind of, but that's, and it's, a, and it's a sinful, broken world, and that's part of the deal. Is that we, make the, we make things that separate us from God, or make decisions that separate us from God. I don't know. Thoughts? You can tell me I'm wrong. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to go. All right. Somebody help. Not a problem. Thanks. Have a good night. Good see it. Any other? Question. Sometimes it's hard to know. You want to do the right thing, but it's you don't always have a clear answer right. to what you think he wants us to do. And why is that? Mm -hmm. you know, why don't we have a, you know, if we beseech in a prayer, mm -hmm. why don't we always feel confident that we've chosen them? Mm -hmm. They're always... That's a great question. Anybody have any thoughts about that? <laughs> <laughs> He's looking for an answer. No, I, got, I got opinions, but yeah. I'm curious what other people think, too. Sometimes I wonder, um, so if God gives us what we need to make the decisions we have, right? Um, I wonder if, um, like when somebody, when somebody comes to me in there, and I have this happen occasionally where people say, I just need, I have a really difficult decision to make. And I need some, well I can't make the decision for them, but I can listen and I can bounce, you know, I can be a sounding board and all that. And inevitably, what I almost always discover is they actually know what the right decision is. Um, and and the, the, the decision isn't the problem, it's having, the, it's having the, the wherewithal to make the decision. 
because um, sometimes the right decision is the hardest thing. And uh, they almost always know. And that's, I think I think that's how you know. I think God works. I think we pray. I think we read Scripture. I think we do those things. None of those things will give us the answer. Should I do this or not? But I think it it ties into our intuition. And I think sometimes God works through our gut. I think that's what the conscience kind of is. Conscience is just gut that tells us um, after the fact <laughs> often what's right or what's wrong. Um, and I think the gut can tell us as well. What does our instinct tell us about what, are, what the right the right decision is? Um, and actually, it's interesting. There's been there's a study or a book. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Blink um, about how we make decisions. It's a really fascinating book. And he talks about like statistically, we've studied this. Your first instinct in making a decision is almost always the right decision. The problem is we talk ourselves out of it. And so he, he, he said, it's blink, it's like blink. in the blink of an eye, you make a decision, your gut knows what to do, but then you start processing it, and we process ourselves into a different decision. Um, and I think that instinct is one of the ways that God works within us. Now I'm speaking in generalizations, and, and sometimes you really have to think through things and come up with a conclusion, I know that. Um, but the reality is there's no, I mean, in those situations, there's no good answer. You just have to try to, sometimes you just make your decision and, and sort it out. Um, so that's a really good non-answer to your question. <laughs> um, but I think I talk about yeah, we pray, we listen, we discern, um, and uh, um, and we trust that we trust our instinct and the gifts that God has given us. We make a decision as best we can do. And when that doesn't work, we rely on grace. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? And that left it. We were going to talk about kind of God's plan and, and, and that kind of a thing, which is another section in here, but we'll maybe see if we can come back to that when we meet next time. The, um, uh, there we go. Go through that plan. There we go. For next time, two weeks from now, um, if you wouldn't mind reading chapter 2, verses 1 to 22, which is basically chapter 2, um, the, um, we're going to, that's what we're going to take a look at um, in the time that we are together in two weeks. So, any other thoughts? Let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be on our way. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks again um, that we have this chance to dig into scriptures and to seek your will. God, we ask uh, for wisdom and guidance because it is difficult and it is complicated, and this is real life stuff, and we have to make decisions all the time. We have to do things that are hard. Um, But we know that you call us by name, you claim us, and and you give us these gifts, this identity of being blessed and loved um, and and redeemed and cared for and grace-filled and spirit-filled children of you. Um, God, let us trust in that identity and in the things that you give us that we can uh, uh, can be your people and live as you call us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Right. Oh, yeah. No, we're talking about God's will and God's plan. That's a quick conversation. Right? I know. Yeah. <laughs>